Depending on how you count and how you read it, we are currently in the third software crisis, which shows itself in ever longer and more expensive software projects, which in their results also do not meet the expectations. Um, and there are some real uh, counterparts, such as overpriced construction projects that the Herald cited. So what next? Computer scientists, business people are dealing, looking at these questions and wondering what technology philosophy could contribute here. And our speaker, Ayuvo, is a broadcaster, technology philosopher, and he does radio and cooperatives. And in his talk, he will take us by the hand and tell us what we have to expect in a software crisis 4.0. And Ayuvo, it's your stage. Welcome. At the Chaos Studio in Potsdam, I am Ayuvo, and close to the end of this year's Easter Divock Bridging Bubbles, I would like to give you a small talk of 20 minutes with a subsequent Q&A, and if you want a big blue button session about the software crisis. That is a very familiar term. It is used in university lectures, but that only leads us to the present and what will happen in the future. That is something that you may just worry about, depending where you are. I want to use this short time to update you on what technology philosophy has to say on this issue. So it will be 20 minutes, 20 minutes Q&A, and then the big blue button round, and you can see the links in the pre-talks page. If you would like to join us there, and there are further links on those pages on participating in the exchange. Of course, this is not an issue that everyone in IT is normally confronted with. Those that have studied computer science maybe have heard about it, and the first few phases in the software crisis are well understood, and they are uh, the topic of university lectures and so on. I would like to briefly explain these two phases, where this all came from, and uh, talk about the way the problem is shaped at the moment and about the approaches and the hopes and dead ends that the future may hold for us. Now, regarding history, let's start with, um, start like this. When things were as they were when God created computers, we were talking about mainframes that you were perhaps leasing from the makers or maybe building yourself, maybe bought. And with that, you had a handbook, a manual, literally taken, that was about 100 kilos perhaps, and the software was something that please you should write yourself. So from one user to the next, things were quite different. From that resulted about 20 years after the introduction of the computer as we know it today, we had the so-called first software crisis, which led to uh, a conference which, uh, interestingly, took place uh, in Lake, at Lake Constance in southern Germany in 1968. And the issue there was what the computer scientist Dijkstra called the hardware pr progress being faster than the software progress, and that was supposed to be a problem. And it was actually NATO that ran this conference, which shows that uh, where the responsibilities and the interests, how they were distributed, computers were a mainly military issue that was, and, and the problems were to solved by the military, were to be solved by the military. And the second phase was in the 1970s and 80s, where you could say that up to the beginnings of the internet as we know it today, or as it was foreseen on the horizon, we had software engineering in a literal sense, you could say, projects that would define from the start very exactly what the objectives were, how the project was to be executed. There's a German term, the um, uh, kind of project uh, obligations sheet. Um, 
where you wrote down what you were to produce and what you used for controlling and all that. And of course, you know, software te te technology kept growing and uh, became a nonlinear process. So it became too big, too slow and too complex for these structures. And that was phase two of the software crisis as we are taught it today at universities. And that was exactly what we are still dealing with today in the last 30 years. And that was this arbitrary kind of, um, in this arbitrary kind of perspective, that was phase three, where people tried to use dynamic methods to deal with the increase in complexity and, and the uh, size of the structures. And these 30 years, um, it seems uh, for a while, these 30 years are nearing their end. And that means that we are going to enter a crisis 4.0, where we don't know how things are going to be. Now, with the begin of the actual internet, you had collaborative and simultaneous forms of work and uh, clearly a phase of euphoria. Everything is networked. Everyone can take part in a decentralized, simultaneous way. And that way we will very easily develop all the, uh, we will not no longer lag behind the progress in complexity and be ahead of the curve, as people would like to say. Um, so the internet was going to be the source and solution of all the problems. And using the old methods from phase two, there was a lot that you could deal with. The older among us remember how the progress from Windows 95 to Windows Vista was managed, where everything was still quite static and uh, security requirements were raised to a fairly new level. The last time when a large project really delivered even though the users didn't quite notice it at the time. And together with that euphoria, all those very sensible progressions and losses of control came about. Uh, the um, management of the human factor that became more and more difficult, the working climate, as it were, the collaborative methods of packaging, the education, uh, sorry, the, the establishment of the open source idea as we know it today, the availability of libraries and complexity of dependencies, the introduction of new layers between assembly, machine language and the person in front of the screen, all that uh, contributed to those last 30 years of the software crisis 3.0 becoming more and more dynamic. And I remind you of historic issues such as computer-aided programming and so on. Now, today, some people say we are in the crisis 3.9, where all the countermeasures, uh, emergency exits, dead ends, and uh, quicksands are kind of culminating and we don't know how long we can continue. Keywords are standardization, lock-ins. For example, if you as a small or medium enterprise were uh, using Microsoft, that is the so-called industry standard. If this used to be in the 70s, you would say no one was ever fired for buying IBM. It's now more it's the same regarding Microsoft, but the problems are getting larger all the time. And many of us know many of us that have seen the methods that were developed to save us from the consequences of ever increasing complexity, agile, scrum, and so on. So these were the emergency exits that became an everyday issue, everyday tool, and they often became dead ends and quicksands and drove costs up. And uh, not to speak of the human factors and human emergencies that were involved. So what is the philosophical perspective I'm not going to burden you with a lot of technical terminology from philosophy. Uh, so from a non-technical, non-philosophical point of view, you have a choice, a crisis of trust, of control and legitimacy. The sense of loss in software is something that everybody knows. Politics is having a hard time. Just think of the uh, struggle for critical infrastructure and securing that 
to deal with the security holes there. So all the authorities, the financial authorities, legal authorities, uh, moral authorities, are experiencing a loss of trust, control and legitimacy. The philosopher sees this under the term of ethics, and this thought involves the concept of a golem for more than a century, so an artificially created subject that is alive, that has to be assigned a certain ethical value to, and which you try to control. Agency is a word that is often used in English-speaking philosophy. The problems that arise if something that you created yourself is then acting on itself, and uh, again, a term from English, the moral hazard, which older people will know from real socialism, uh, or in a modern sense, the free rider problem. So as a human or a human group, you don't actually act in a way that the common good is optimized. You pursue your own agenda. That is why agency comes in here. So these are all issues that have a long backtrack and that are well documented. That is how philosophers work. And using this backtrack, we try to conduct impact assessment from a technology philosophy point of view to try to assess what the consequences will be in a more or less defined amount of time. And that brings us to the hypothesis and the attempt to extend the current problems and solution approaches using the means of technolo technology impact assessment to see what might happen. And the assumption that arises from there is that is this, that the next phase of looking for solution for, from all this complexity and the loss of control could be to use the whole AI, artificial intelligence paradigm, to software development. And precursors might be keywords such as low-code or even no-code, so strategies and tools and methods that amount to software development no longer being done by humans, but rather several layers of software and computers that you need to program computers. What are the known problems here and extensions or the unknown extensions, the assumptions, assumptions that you need a computer to program a computer is something that we've seen in microchip production. We see that already. We have the issue of the lack, lack of accountability, not to speak of legitimacy. Just think of the accountability of democratic elections. Uh, the issue why we were always arguing against uh, election computers. Uh, the same could apply to software development. And what is the key question here? Well, there is a thought experiment which is hard to contradict in philosophy that is looking for a theoretical or empirical solution. And that is the assumption that we still haven't managed to simulate enough neurons uh, and put them into a computer um, so that we could even approach the uh, complexity of the human brain. And the hypothesis that is hard to contradict here is what if we do, did manage to amass the required number of neurons, couldn't we reach a point where we surpass a certain critical stage that a certain kind of consciousness might arise? And how and from which criteria will we notice that? And what happens if we do? That is where ethics will then reach its next extensions regarding control and legitimacy. Shouldn't we then define machine rights as a counterpart of human rights? Would we create a new kind of creature, living creature? This seems very far-fetched and very um, marginal, but that might actually be a consequence of the crisis 4.0, not just computers, programming, programming computers and becoming indispensable, but these computers that pro but do program computers might then develop a kind of conscience. So that means the question of the image of the human and the image of the machine 
How about conflicts, keyword cyber war, human-machine conflicts? How about the interface between human and machine? How do we notice that a consciousness might arise? And all these questions under the keyword of transhumanism, hybrid creatures, and so on. And from a macroeconomical point of view, the issue is markets, democracies, and human rights, transparency and machine rights. How does that all map out if evolution processes are in competition with each other, be it in markets or some kind of political, hopefully democratic processes? Do we need voting rights for machines that reproduce themselves? Is there something like a software Darwinism or will we have certain markets that reproduce this? Could they be distorted in some way? So uh, some economic issues here and how would you deal with the changed role of the human? Um, what is the indis indispensable human? issue. That's something that we as philosophers will have to think. What happens if we have machines with a certain amount of consciousness that are supposed to program other machines? Where are we then? And do we see precursors? I've talked about keywords such as low code or no code. That seems very low key, but could that possibly be a first indicator of what we have to look for? What can we hope to quote Immanuel Kant? What is the optimistic, positive uh, variety? Does it have to be a dystopia? Could it be a utopia? And how do we need to prepare? These are the kinds of questions that technology philosophy uh, would have to ask to an anticipated software crisis 4.0. And then the question to us as the chaos, what do we do to what? To what dot AI, we had this uh, to what is, is do something. So the AI problem um, was something that we dealt with. And after sketching out what we are dealing with, let's look at the initiatives and let's talk about it. If you want, let's do it in right in the Q&A and the big blue button. And these are the keywords under which you can find me. Let's see if in the next few months we can establish a dialogue. My colleagues from technology, philosophy and I would very much be interested in feedback. And uh, I also do a bit of radio, if you would like a radio program, both in CBase and CCC Potsdam. Uh, there are radio programs that are being produced, so you could actually use those to uh, uh, put the debate into radio. So if that's what you want, please let me know. And thank you for that. And that gets us to the Q&A. Wow. Wow. Are you for what a talk? Um, thank you. A virtual applause. A short insight into the Pandora's box. And I think it's not just software developers that were listening with interest. Um, and I think from software developers to philosophers, these are people that will be interesting. Um, so, to use one quote from Kant, what can we hope for? And let me add, what do we have to fear? Good question. I have tried to kind of teaser this, what we would have to fear. And what is this old Schwarzenegger movie called? Since the old science fiction novels from the 1920s, when the machines turn against the humans, it doesn't have to be this way, of course. We may not be killed by certain autonomous robots. It might just be a very subtle development by the loss of control in software project taking on completely new forms that we may not even notice at first. Okay, uh, just to link to that next question uh, from the Q&A pad. Uh, would low code and no code, as you talked about, uh, wouldn't that lead to a kind of um, uh, exponentiation of this golem? Is the accountability of code even possible if in a neural network 
code and data are melted together. Well, it depends on the kind of expectations you have. Even though I have no real clue here, I have to listen to what people tell me when who are involved in the production of microchips, where we uh, do know that the lowest layers are no longer really understandable by anyone. I think we are going through a very long gray area of con loss of control, and that is not going to ha happen at a stroke. Uh, I think we will have to get used to, or we will get used to, as generations are dying out. Uh, and of course, there's always the progress uh, and people are keep saying okay in a few years time we will get here and reach this kind of stage and in the end it takes a long long time so i cannot really say if what i'm trying to sketch as a kind of logical extension if you can use that word of the impact assessment if this kind of scenario will be here in 25 years or in 125 years, I have no idea. But the problems that we have seen in phase three of the software crisis, they are growing on an exponential scale, it seems. Yes, that's the impression I get too. Um, hardware is developing faster and faster and, and we are not catching up. And the faster we run, it seems, the faster we enter into an even bigger crisis. Yes, I do sometimes I get the question, this is all unrealistic, why should someone do this? Why should we just enter in this huge struggle? And well, at the very beginning of my education, I became an economist and uh, I can remember uh, this idea of oh, this kind of effort is nothing that anyone will go to. That kind of assumption failed in IT as well, because the lack of experts and the lack of workforce uh, will always lead people to say, OK, let's try a technological solution, which doesn't have to mean that the uh, transition into uh, phase four will only consists of great solutions. Um, it might just happen that very bad solutions are being deployed simply through the promise of cost savings. And uh, I think we shouldn't just say, we shouldn't just um, explain things with sinister conspiracies when it's just cost savings and stupidity that are enough to explain. So it doesn't really have to be the case that we have uh, a full-blown phase four immediately. It will be more of a quicksand kind of development, a kind of gray area that we go through. And the arguments of getting involved isn't just simply because we can, maybe we can't, but we may believe and we may believe that the cost savings are possible. And that, of course, could, could be a kind of evolution, right? So we're trying more and more, and that gets us deeper and deeper into the crisis. Could be, yes, some people describe it in this way, and that is very arbitrary. You could, of course, divide it into eight or five or three phases, but um, if we try to extend this, um, and uh, th then I think that phase four is going to look as I described it, and uh, we see the problems now, don't we? Oh, yes, we do. And you also said an aspect that I would like to deal with. If our brain, the monkey's brain that I brought with me, isn't even able to recognize itself in its whole depth, then the question is, will we ever uh, be able to recognize an artificial intelligence, however it is going to look like. Yes, uh, in that whole AI debate of the last, I think, 20 years, that was one of the main aspects, as you've said. Our brain structure gives us all kinds of limitations and uh, in becoming self-aware. And that, of course, will happen again. And not least the artists and the authors and filmmakers, they, all, they are they're demonstrating us already. Maybe there is a kind of AI already, not just a lower kind of intelligence that we see in IT. Maybe we just haven't noticed it yet without trying to promote someone. But Mark Uwe Kling, I'm just reading part two, is kind of enlightening. Ah, you think the, the book that you can get in black and white? No promotion here. Yeah, I forgot the title too. Uh, yes, and you can deal with it in a humorous way too, of course, like Mark Uwe Kling does. And maybe that is the only way. Well, don't 
just be too pessimistic. One further question. Next time, we always have to adapt the solution to the problem, question mark. Couldn't we perhaps adapt the problem to the solution? So why do we need drones that navigate with ever more image processing if we could, quote, simply uh, construct a tube post network that network doesn't know of any other traffic participants, such as birds. So the idea is clear. Just focus on that problem and reduce it. Yes. Um, well, my spontaneous thought is uh, it didn't quite work from the beginning of technological development. Uh, I'm not going to say because we can and explain it this way. That might be a bit too simplistic, but as long as there is competition uh, and evolutionary systems that are a kind of competition, then people will always try to do something differently. And again, uh, that whole terrible marketing problem exists here too. It's not so important that software actually has more capabilities, uh, only that it can be sold as such, just a very broad, rough thought here. So in, independent of the social system, these are fundamental conditions of the human evolution. And to extend this a bit further, uh, maybe it's just this marketing machinery that is to blame for software becoming faster and faster and the programming becoming more and more difficult and software doing things that it wouldn't do. Well, I would ex go beyond marketing here. Uh, economic systems that do not have marketing uh, exist. Think of the Cold War that we all have to think back to these days. Uh, there was a kind of competition of systems there and uh, a kind of military innovation that wasn't tried out. It doesn't always have to be in a market kind of system. It could have, you could have a bipolar Cold War kind of model where two parties, two agents uh, just imagine or present themselves with a scenario of mutual destruction and play it one-to-one, -one, as it were. Yeah. What do you believe out of these probable scenarios or aspects that you are outlining here? Which do you think will be the earliest one to catch up with us? Ah, well, my glass ball, my crystal ball, sorry, it broke two days from now. Um, well, first, let's ask from when we start perceiving this in, it in this way. Some people might believe that it's possible. Some might say that, oh, this is real AI, to, to pick one example, and others might say, oh, not at all. AI as a marketing term is, of course, ubiquitous. I like to say artificial lower intelligence. You can run a kind of simulation like that, whether we accept it or not, is a cultural and a mentality issue. Uh, the first experiments are 230 years old. The Mechanical Turk, we all know this story. And then came good old Leibniz with the determinism and the machine that uh, they thought that you could calculate the world. Yeah, that actually went until the uh, German Empire, first German Empire. Um, so this kind of building of thought is what the whole phase two was based on when you thought that you could have a whole engineering approach with a project sheet that contained all the requirements from the start and, and like that. And interestingly, the first programmers were uh, mechanics, weren't they? Um, dealing with the smallest kind of mechanical problems. And there were women, too. Um, the males of the species were dealing with the, well, we could, would call it architecture these days, but the actual coding or linking up of things, that was, uh, as it was at the time, it was women's work. And uh, it was it took until the early 70s to change that. Very interesting sociological phenomenon. And there's a lot of research on that, too. A small ray of hope lit up for a while when you talked about the fact that we are not looking into the whole depth anymore. All these libraries written in C, we keep using them, written in the 70s. And one positive aspect maybe is that there is a group of people that is actually able to still look into that. And that's the hackers. Uh, 
So we could uh, tidy things up there, couldn't we? Yes, they still exist. I still remember quite clearly when I was working on the Y2K bug uh, and profiting from that because I was still able to uh, fix uh, date fields in COBOL and other things like that. It wasn't rocket science at the time, but uh, you were actually weeding out people from the old pensioners' homes at the time to solve these things. That's how it worked. That's what was done. And maybe we won't have any humans man maintaining old code, but maybe there will be machines that are still able to do it. Maybe. Picking up on this aspect, if I talk about artificial intelligence on the one side and the Internet of Things on the other, maybe that will exponentiate the communication of machines among each other and cause an explosion of a development, and I'm going to extrapolate here, and maybe that might bring about a consciousness because the human body too consists of billions of cells that communicate in a certain way. Could be. Of course, the question is when the participants in such a network uh, regard their uh, kind of perception as a consciousness. My fridge will probably not reach that stage. If anything will reach that stage during my lifetime, we'll have to see. But uh, the beginnings, the beginning of that phase will be debatable. For sure, there might be differences. Some might accept this. It's consider the way the Japanese deal with robots in contrast to the, to the way we deal with them. Yes, and it would be a nightmare if uh, the problem of uh, care for the elderly can only be dealt with with robots. I don't know. Uh, to be, grow old or very old means that my radius is keeps shrinking until it consists maybe of just the room in my or pensioners home and if I have built the robots myself that then help me that wouldn't be so bad would it well then the nightmare you may fear is not mine because I fear that a robot might kill me because they hadn't run the Windows update or something well maybe you could take precautions by uh, maybe Build your own technological environment at your last address yourself. But we're uh, drifting. Yes, maybe we are. How about the constraint oriented programming? Another question with higher order logic. Uh, I hope you can understand these terms from the pad. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, these are programming theory terms, and that is part of the way towards that. Maybe that is on the borderline between 3.9 and 4.0, uh, but these approaches uh, are what might lead to a situation where the next evolutionary step does look like that, because that's what results if you conduct an impact assessment on the basis of current and problems. Yes, I have a, another comment talking about care for the elderly with robots and the writer thinks, well, that is kind of good because that will mean that the emotional burden on care workers is no longer there. Yes, it was in the 90s, I think, the ELISA experiment, you can Google it. Um, people with mental problems, uh, inhabitants of old age people's homes, were quite ready to communicate with a computer uh, at the technological stage of 20, 30 years ago, accept that computer as a communication partner and then not feel alone anymore. And, uh, the computer would repeat questions, wouldn't it? So this kind of therapeutic approach, um, yeah? Really? Do you think so? Uh, yeah. Why do you want to know how the weather is going to be? Maybe that too. Yeah, that is close to, sorry Dave, I can't do that. Uh, and of course the goal of Turing test uh, would be, receive an update there. How do we recognize uh, what kind of soft uh, entity we're dealing with? Yes, but the test you apply is always an individual question, but also a cultural question we'll have to see. And the question is uh, whether in the 3.9 phase will we progress to 3.99 
or when we will actually uh, get across the threshold. Yes, and actually maybe it's not a crisis of the software. Just to pose an example, just think of Siri. Eliza is called Siri these days. And if I use it, or if I would, were to activate it, and Siri uh, would ask, I would ask Siri to set an alarm for me, and Siri would say, thank you. I might imagine that many that are not so close to technology, uh, not as much as people that look at technology and hardware all the time, they might see this as a kind of life form with, with which they interact. Yes, well, I did try to, to kind of limit the, um, what I'm talking about to software. It doesn't have to be that all of our reality changes in this way, and that might be a bit too ambitious to uh, thought. Uh, but maybe in 25 or 125 years, I think the next stage of the crisis will be there, and it might be caused by dif different things. Um, maybe the artificial lower intelligence will no longer uh, be in step with the hardware advances, or maybe there will be a cultural conflict that people don't agree on around the globe, what the next phase should be or will be. And of course, from a very biological sense, if the latest organic uh, storage chips are dead, that we're able to read that code, maybe we're only that's the only thing that's left would be machines. A small ray of hope concerning Siri, if Siri does set the alarm for me and I don't say thank you, I actually experienced this twice. That caused Siri to simply crash. So maybe, let's see. We'll see. Do we have anything else? Actually, looking through the pad, I think the Q&A pad has been exhausted. A hint, maybe the fascination for a more simple solution, a recommendation from the audience there, a, a link. SolarLowTechMagazine.com. I have no way of verifying this. Oh, spelling it out, solarlowtechmagazine.com, uh, a recommendation from the audience regarding simpler... <laughs>